So hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'll introduce myself in the next slide. <laughs> but just want to tell you um, a little bit about, so the title of this webinar is Why Berkeley? And one of the reasons why is that this is our founding place. This is why Berkeley is so special. And it comes to our origin story. So our founders um, recognized that there was this gap in uh, technology commercialization. Um, where it was just really hard to get companies founded um, right out of uh, academic research. Um, you know, you 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 didn't quite you weren't quite far enough along to get an SBIR. Um, maybe you needed some proof of concepts. Maybe you needed to talk to customers. Like you know, maybe you needed all of these things that you need in those initial steps. Um, and a little bit of funding would would really help in commercializing technologies. And so they went to the, the division director of Lawrence Berkeley National, or the, the lab director of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and pitched this idea. And so the Berkeley lab made an investment into this idea. And so that was the experiment in 2015. And they, you know, they opened up applications uh, with like two weeks um, and got, you know, more than 100 applications. And this program was born. Um, so really identified this, this gap in the science to market ecosystem. Um, through many iterations, uh, you know, it, it was a startup like, like your startups, um, you know, didn't have the, the, you know, tried lots of different things before they think they found the thing that worked, um, but eventually came to the model that we're going to tell you about today, and then expanded over time. Um, and we'll tell you about that expansion in a minute. But now we're going to introduce ourselves. So I'm Jill, I'm the Managing Director of Activate Berkeley. And so this is a, a partnership between Activate, which is a nonprofit, and Cyclotron Road, which is a program at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And it's really like these two teams that come together to, to run this super special program in Berkeley. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Katie, you wanna introduce? Oh, I was gonna tell something about myself. So I'm a, um, a biochemist by training. Um, and worked at Berkeley Lab for many years um, and spun a company out of there called Cinder Bio, um, which uh, I was actually a fellow of Cyclotron Road in cohort 2018 and was, so went through the program. Um, and then I've been the managing director um, of, at Activate Berkeley since uh, July of last year. All right, Katie. Yeah, I already introduced myself, um, but for those of you who joined a moment late, my name is Katie Sharp. I'm the Senior Fellowship Manager, so I work closely with Jill to support all of our Berkeley Fellows. Um, my background is in cell biology and genetics. I did my PhD in Stan at Stanford and came to this role actually from a postdoc at UC Berkeley. So I have a similar academic background to many of our fellows. Um, and it's just my pleasure and my joy to support our fellows uh, through their time in the fellowship. Um, and as I said, I've been with Activate since July of 2020. Um, and I will pass it off to Caroline. Hi, I'm Caroline. Uh, I'm the fellowship associate at Activate Berkeley. Uh, I have a background in environmental science and communication, and I came to activate from the Aspen Institute. And uh, I've been here for just under three months, and I can personally say I really enjoy it, and I hope uh, to see you all enjoying it too. And I will pass it off to our LBL friends. Yeah, thank you, uh, Caroline. So hi, everyone. My name is Todd Prey. I, I work at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I'm the lab's chief strategic partnerships officer. Uh, I've been at the lab for almost 10 years now. Uh, before that, I spent about a dozen years in the biotech industry, the first six years or so in your traditional pharmaceutical biotechnology industry, drug discovery, et cetera, everything from Alzheimer's to oncology. And the last six or so years, I spent in the industrial biotech space, working on biofuels and bioproducts at a company called Amaris, had a short stint at Impossible Foods. So I worked very closely with the founding teams of these companies. Um, I have not been a founder myself, but I feel like I, I know many of them quite well, some of the, the ins and outs and pros and cons. And um, when I first came to Berkeley Lab, I ran uh, our advanced biofuels and bioproducts process development unit, helping a lot of startups scale their processes and technologies and get things to market. So we worked with over 40 companies in a span of five years, and that group continues to support a lot of Cyclotron Road and Activate Fellows. Um, so my team, uh, we manage the program now. It came into the lab directorate. So you have access to the lab director, the deputy director, who's my boss, our strategic communications team. So we work really hard to make sure you get to interface a lot with important Department of Energy opportunities and stakeholders here at the laboratory. 
And Melanie is our guru. I'll turn it over to her. Hello. Um, <clears throat> there's some noise where I'm at, so hopefully you can hear me clearly. I'm Melanie Sunstang. I'm the program manager for the Cyclotron Road program at Berkeley Lab, um, the laboratory embedded entrepreneurship program side of things. Um, and we worked closely with Activate, um, which is why we're here to try and support you as you figure out how and why to apply for um, the program. Um, for the fellows that come into the program, I help them interface with all aspects of the lab to help them um, find their way through um, facilities and scientific connections and operational support. And I've been with the program since 2015. And Tom isn't here, but I think that we'll, you'll get the point that you have a, a wide array of, of support coming from both programs as we move forward. If you do end up applying and you make it to our video interview stage, you will be meeting Tom along. Uh, uh, he is a member of our selection committee and he is uh, great and is always happy to help fellows get connected to resources at the lab. And Katie, can I, maybe I'll just say a bit about Tom's background. So Jill and I and Katie, you know, more of like biosciences background. Tom has a hardcore energy technologies background. So he's a really good connection into energy efficiency and re renewable energy program offices, uh, anything on the applied side. So it's not just a biotech program. In fact, biotech is not the main emphasis. It's kind of biotech plus everything else that is hard to get an energy tech startup uh, running in. Thanks, Todd. That's super helpful. So yeah, so as we mentioned, two entities, uh, and we both expanded it. So we just want to tell you a little bit um, about that. So the uh, Activates, the nonprofit, started at the beginning to support this program. Um, we've since expanded to um, now five locations, uh, expanded to Boston in 2019, New York and anywhere since 2021, and then have added um, Activate Houston. Um, and so uh, validation that this this model works well, um, and as you as you you know are exploring the program, uh, we encourage you to explore the site that you know the the community that works best for you and is going to make you the most successful. And then the leap programs, so we're we're throwing a lots of things around, um, but uh, Todd's going to tell you about the the leap program and and Cyclotron Road and the other locations. Yeah, one, one of the unique features that Jill alluded to it, in the Berkeley community as an Activate Fellow, you uh, most Activate Fellows are also Cyclotron Road Fellows and program members at Berkeley Lab, which is a Department of Energy National Laboratory. If you saw Oppenheimer, uh, you know, a few months ago, it's where uh, Lawrence started his work in, in the Ber University of California Berkeley Physics Department, and he started the Radiation Lab, which led to Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project as kind of the progenitor to the national lab system uh, back in the 1930s and 40s. Um, so just like Oppenheimer started that project uh, working with Berkeley, um, Cyclotron Road started this lab embedded entrepreneurship program in the national lab system. So three other national labs have adopted programs. Uh, Westgate and NREL uh, just started uh, a year or two ago. Um, but you know we, we partner a lot with NREL on a lot of projects as well as with Argonne National Laboratory and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, so there's a very close network between them. We're creating a community among the fellows in these various LEAP node programs across the national labs. And we, and as I mentioned earlier, we, we're getting a lot of access now to the Department of Energy. Uh, if you're a member of the program here in Berkeley, you'll get the chance to meet DOE leadership as they come through and visit the laboratory. Um, so we, we really try and create a rich environment where um, you're getting a great entrepreneurship curriculum through Activate and through the lab, you're getting exposed to all the opportunities that federal funding as well as state funding agencies can offer. Um, and this program may grow. Um, I think other laboratories are interested in developing an entrepreneurship program like this. Um, and so it's something that we feel uh, really proud of having started. And we're very proud of every cohort that comes in. We try and do our best to make sure that they're well connected at the other labs as it becomes helpful and with the department itself. And just a, a few points to recap. I think we've touched on many of these points uh, along the way so far, but just so you have all the information in front of you, uh, this Activate partnership with Cyclotron Road at Berkeley Lab, um, you know, the fellowship was originally founded in 2015. Uh, as Joe mentioned, the lab invested actually some funds, discretionary funds uh, to kick this off. Then the Department of Energy saw the success and got interested. And so now Department of Energy is providing support 
to the lab and to the fellows. Um, Activate spun out as a nonprofit to run the fellowship in partnership with the laboratory and then expanded across the country, as Jill mentioned. Um, I, I described uh, you know, that we are one of the four lab embedded entrepreneur programs, um, you know, among those at NREL, Argonne, Oak Ridge National Labs. And fellows in Berkeley access uh, facilities, our lab and the R&D funds you get as part of the fellowship through, through Activate's partnership with us at LBL. And so there's a wide array of facilities and programs. And I think Melanie will talk more about those later. Uh, the bottom line here, and it's spelled out for you, um, this is a very uh, cross-functional, diverse program of different capabilities, uh, people, expertise. And so you have multiple organizations uh, championing your success from Activate, Cycleton Road, the lab itself, and, and even the Department of Energy. All right. Thanks, Todd. Great summary of the partnership. Um, and so, you know, this expansion and LEAP and then Activate all built on this one model that's been very successful. So what is that model? What is the fellowship? So it's two years um, of stipend. So that's 90 to 110 K um, plus a travel allowance, um, which is uh, $12,000 can also be used for professional development, health insurance, relocation funds, if you should relocate, plus $100,000 in R&D funds that are accessed um, through Berkeley Lab, um, and access to at least $75,000 in additional flexible capital. So those, those items above that 75K, the stipend um, and the 100K in R&D funds and the travel and all this sort of stuff, that's without fee or equity um, in the, in the you know, we don't take any equity in the companies. If you choose, um, to participate in this flexible capital that is in the form of a, a safe note or a simple agreement for equity. So that would be an exchange for equity. Um, uh, and so lots of funds, support, that sort of stuff. Um, through Activate, you get access to um, an entrepreneurial education. So this is like a, a curriculum that is tailor-made for scientists that are jumping into the entrepreneurial journey, we really build on your scientific training. Um, there's mentorship involved with that. So one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship with me, um, and then also uh, intensive workshops. We have a, um, a ongoing educational uh, programming um, that really uh, you know, seeks to meet you where you are and your needs um, at the moment uh, in terms of the stage of your company and that sort of thing. We also have an incredible network um, so alumni of the program is quite large, especially in Berkeley. We really have a strong alumni network, um, plus a network of investors, people who are used to um, understanding like the timelines of hard tech development and that sort of thing. And this is like, really, I feel like our secret sauce is this amazing community that we have in Berkeley um, and across Activate and across LEAP. Um, and through uh, our partnership with uh, Cyclotron Road, you get access to a world-class research facility at Berkeley Lab, and that includes dedicated lab space. Um, and that's really a unique feature of our Berkeley program um, and access to incredible uh, experts in many fields um, you know, across Berkeley Lab. All right, next slide. So what does the program look like, um, you know, kind of on a day-to-day a, a -day basis? Um, so every other Thursday, we gather for local programming. This is really a keystone of the program. And what does that look like? We have um, a community lunch and we have programming. So we bring in a number of speakers, whether that's alumni or um, people from Berkeley Lab or founders of uh, other companies or, you know, it's just very diverse in the programming that we that we have. Um, then from 2.30 to 4.30, we have um, what we call collisions. So this is where we bring in visitors to meet one-on-one -on -one with fellows. Um, key part of the, the program and just gets you really used to like talking to anyone about what you're doing and you know, you might collide with someone who is going to really make the difference um, in your company and your success. So that's uh, why we we have those collisions. And then we have a, a social hour where it's just a time to like connect in another way. Um, there's also uh, monthly one on one meetings with me um, and other staff. Uh, we also have quarterly uh, advisory board meetings. This is a keystone of the, the program, getting you to think about 
um, thinking in quarters and reflecting on the progress from last quarter, what you really need to, to do in the next quarter. And then of course we have monthly community events and other, other community events. All right. Great. Right. Um, and then I think Melanie is gonna share some of the uh, resources available to our fellows at Berkeley Lab. Yes, hello again. So um, among the things that we were mentioning briefly that make the uh, Berkeley program really epic to be a part of is the access to um, phenomenal research resources capabilities. Um, there are a lot of them at Berkeley Lab. There are five US Department of Energy um, Office of Science National User Facilities. Two of the ones that are very well known are listed here, the Molecular Foundry and the Advanced Biofuels and Bioproducts Process Development Unit. There are three others, and then there are also um, five different major research areas that have a number of divisions underneath them. So the array of uh, technical um, capability that's represented at the lab for our fellows to tap into um, is, is really phenomenal. Um, I encourage anybody who's interested in knowing whether there's um, so resources that are specific to the type of research you're wanting to do to visit the Berkeley Lab website and explore the array of facilities, um, centers, and research areas because it's too large to go over in, in one webinar. Um, we also support collaborations with these Berkeley Lab scientists, so not just the facilities use, but also the technical expertise that people may want um, either from a, a you know, hands-off mentorship role all the way down to you know, in the lab at the same time, running the equipment, figuring out how to test what you need to test. Um, we also, as somebody mentioned, um, have some dedicated Cyclotron Road laboratory space that is separate from where our collaborators work. Um, so that gives fellows a lot of flexibility in, in what they need to do on site and whether there is space for them in any of the facilities. And we have dedicated office space. Um, we will help manage your CRADA project and administer your funds for you. And so we'll provide some administrative support to um, help reduce the, the burden there on that. And then I left the last one in too, because that feels like Tom K, Tom Kirchstetter is here with us in spirit. He, he wants us to make sure that you know that we have a pretty killer view of the bay. Uh, you can see it in the photo there. And we also, um, if you're familiar with the Berkeley area, you know we're just uphill from UC Berkeley. And um, so there's also the opportunity to collaborate with UC Berkeley facility and, and others in our, in our area. That view really can't be beat. And uh, if you're ever having a hard day, but you get to finish the day by looking at that view, it can only get, it can only get better. Um, okay, so um, similar to all of the Activate communities, applications are open right now. Applications are due on October 17th. Um, and then, you know, through the rest of the fall and into the spring, we'll be doing our running our internal selection process. Um, for those who are selected, we'll be doing video interviews in January over Zoom. Um, and then uh, we will be uh, having our finalist week in uh from February 26th to March 1st. For those who are selected as finalists, um, we'll also do help you prepare for that finalist week. Um, and so that's, I think, different from any other programs you might have applied to where our staff is actually gonna help you prep so you can do your absolute best at that finalist week. Um, and then in April, we know, try to notify fellows who are selected and fellows begin their fellowships on June 1st. So um, we hope that you're all planning to apply. If you want to learn more and get more resources, you can check out activate.org slash apply, which has um, at the bottom of that page, there's lots of information on that page, um, the link to actually start your application, as well as mechanisms to book office hours with our recruitment team. You can see recordings of other uh, rec um, recorded recruitment webinars. So um, we've had some panels with specific subsets of founders. So if you want to listen to those, you absolutely should. Um, and you can also check out the Cyclotron Road uh, website to apply now where you can learn a little bit more about the resources that are available at um, Berkeley Lab. Um, and then we have a very special offer for those of you who have uh, attended this webinar, and I will pass it off to Caroline for that. Yeah, so uh, we host monthly happy hours uh, at the Cornerstone in Berkeley, which is uh, a great little spot not too far from our office. And our next one coming up is on October 5th, and we would love for all of you to join us, um, meet some current fellows, you can meet some alumni and staff. Um, they have really, really good food, they have good drinks. It's a, 
it's a really nice time. So I uh, hope you all join us there. Excellent. Thanks, Caroline. Um, and so now, um, perhaps the most important part of this webinar, we are going to introduce you to a couple of current fellows um, and that for, uh, for you to hear from them about why they are with their experience in the fellowship so far. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to make sure they are highlighted for all of you. Um, and perhaps we will start, uh, we'll go in cohort order perhaps, and we'll start with Sarah, who is a member of cohort 2022 and is in the second year of her fellowship. Hi everyone, uh, welcome. I'm glad you're interested in Activate. It's been really great for me. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to found Root Applied Sciences. I did my undergraduate in Earth and Planetary Sciences and first came to California to do my PhD at Berkeley studying soil microbial ecology. After a postdoc at Kellogg Biological Station at Michigan State and a postdoc at INRA in France, I realized that, hey, maybe I don't want to be a professor and what am I going to do with my life? I realized that I loved being on a team and that I really wanted to have an impact, especially with my background and climate change being so important in our lifetime. So I ended up joining a biotech startup and then an ag tech startup, and I became the product manager there. And I learned a lot about how do it and what not to do and <laughs> develop my opinions about things. And I thought I should just try it myself. So I started Root. Um, I should have been more aware of the Activate program earlier on, but I wasn't. Um, I started Root five years ago, and this is my second year in the fellowship. So I went it alone for a while. I am married and my husband has a steady job, which helps, but it was hard. I also have two kids one of the nice things about having your own company and being the boss is that you do have a fair amount of flexibility. So I do work a lot, but I also get to go on the Girl Scouts overnight and um, take the kids to soccer if that needs to happen. Um, we do airborne pathogen monitoring for agriculture. This is our collect and send device, which is how we've gotten into the field with growers for the past few years. But we have been developing a fully automated system, which does microfluidics. And uh, the Activate community has been really wonderful for many reasons. Of course, it's been great to finally get some money for myself. Uh, but even more is the network, the mentorship. Um, we are now inside LBL, which means there are other resources around and people to ask for things. And there's a lot of engineers in the Activate Network, which has also been really helpful because my background is more ecology and molecular biology. And I just also like, you know, there's this support group. And I found that I was part of Skydeck before, which is also a great program. There are a lot of great programs. But one of the other great things about Active is that it's a network of technical founders and we have a very different type of company and often a different strategy when it comes to what our milestones should be and when we need money and how much money we might need because we can't um, just immediately sell a product because we actually have to build it and it needs to work first. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and you will all have plenty of time to ask questions. But first, I want to um, go to Nieves, uh, who is a member of cohort 2023 in Berkeley. So, so she is in the first year of her fellowship and hear from her. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm also glad that you're interested in Activate. I'm very glad I found about it last year. I actually was not aware, as Sarah said, when I started the company, but I found about it last year in November and then I, I applied. So I'm very, very happy that, <laughs> that I ran into it. Um, so my background, um, I'm from Spain. I did my bachelor's in chemistry, my master's in biochemistry, and then I moved to Germany to do my PhD in molecular and cell biology. And then after that, I came to California to do my postdoc at UC Berkeley. So uh, towards, well, when I finished my postdoc, I joined an uh, impact startup or like a, a startup making uh, vegan products. 
And I was, and I had a project in which I had to figure out how to, you know, create recombinant collagen. And that um, kind of uh, directed me into the field of cultivated meat. And I realized that uh, scaffolding was necessary in that industry. And my skill set was, uh, you know, could help in that, in that aspect. So I started a co this company, Noble Farms, in 2020. And then I uh, joined Michelle, who was a former postdoc at UC Berkeley as well, and she joined me as my co-founder and CSO, and I'm, I fulfill the role of CEO. So what I can say about Activate is that even though we started like in 2020 and the, we went through um, uh, an accelerator that was focused on, on alternative protein, uh, products, I um, I realized that Activate provides provides so much, so many resources. Like when you start a company and you start, you need to learn how to kind of set up the company, prepare deck or like all the materials for to start fundraising or like meet new investors and uh, partners, advisor, etc. So everything is like provided by Activate. So it's something that um, I'm very grateful for. And, um, and and yeah, it's like all the resources you can imagine that a, an entrepreneur needs, you can find it here. So. <laughs> okay, well, you heard it directly from a fellow. So I love it. Thank you both so much. Um, yeah, I would now like to open up the floor to questions, either for our staff or for Sarah and Nieves. Um, you can feel free to put them in the chat, or if you go to the reactions uh, button in uh, Zoom, you can raise your hand and we will just call on you in raised hand order. So if any of you have any questions you'd like to ask, we're here. Um, and we'll maybe start with Amelia. Um, hi. Um, so, so thank you for the um, intro for, from, for the two current uh, Activate uh, participants. Um, both of you had said that you had started a company before applying. And I was curious to know, um, like amongst your cohort, was it mostly people who have started companies or were there still, were there a few who are still in the like, idea phase that's not fully formed and uh, you know yeah like a, not even at the start line yet <laughs> all right um I, I can go first um so i would say that uh most of the fellows are just now starting with the company the setup of the company incorporating uh, figuring out the business model uh, in our case, we kind of came on th at the the other end, but it's the majority. I would say is is fresh out of incorporation. I would say, if I don't know, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm sure Katie probably has some statistics on it, but we definitely have cohort members who really just have an idea. We have had. Uh, we have a cohort member who, at least one, who is still working on her PhD and had to finish her PhD before, I think, before she became a full-time fellow. So uh, I think it really runs the gamut. And Yevas and I just happen to be on the, um, with our company wrong, long end. Yeah, I'll just maybe add a little bit of color to that. So we... Um... In general, we are looking for early stage um, founders. Um, one of the hard rules is that you cannot have raised more than $2 million in dilutive funding before the application deadline, so before October 17th. Um, but within early, there's a range of early. And so we're looking for people who need our help and um, and would benefit would really want to participate in the community and would benefit from the fellowship. And so, you know, there is a, a range within each cohort. And then once people join the fellowship, their companies sort of grow at different paces, depending on the status of their tech, their market, whether they're a solo founder or they have a founding team. Um, there's a whole lot of factors that affect um, how easy it is to find product market fit. There's a whole host of factors that affect um, how quickly people's companies grow. Um, and we have found that having that sort of 
bit of range within the cohort is really beneficial because maybe you haven't done something, but someone else has done that thing. And there might be an area where you're very inexperienced and someone else has more experience. Um, so I think those there's a lot of benefits to having a little bit of range within the cohort. But certainly um, if you're uh, incorporating just in time to start the fellowship, we welcome that. I don't know if Jill has any other thoughts to add. Yeah, I just want to clarify, like both uh, Sarah and Yevis had worked at startups before, but neither one had founded a company before. Um, and so, yeah, we are looking for first time founders. Absolutely. Um, William, let's go to you. Cool. Hi. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, we've been to a couple of these office hours. I just want to say I, I love the concept of this program. Um, there's this really awkward in between state, like between an SBIR and pre-seed funding where you see folks will be like, Sounds great. Where's the prototype and the patent? And I'm like, I'm a single income street rat. Anyway, uh, lo love this as a concept. Uh, my, my big question is, um, you know, we're starting to go through the application right now, and it does kind of seem like the answers it's calling for are for one person. Um, and I'm applying as a two person uh, application. So it's me, the science nerd and the, and the business guy. Um, and I'm curious, A, I, I presume we should put our sort of most scientific foot forward and I as the engineer should be the primary applicant. I'm not sure if there's like a back and forth there. Um, so my other question is how flexible is the stipend amount? Could I give half to myself, half to my partner? And, you know, we have some other funding coming in and kind of flesh that out or is it pretty strict? Um, so yeah, is it best to put the scientific foot forward, especially when I feel like a lot of the mentorship seems like it's a lot more around the entrepreneurship side and customer discovery and, you know, partnerships and stuff like that. So it might be better for him to be in person versus my lab. So any, any, any general advice about them layering that would be great. Yeah. Okay. There was a lot in there. If I miss parts of it, you let me know. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. There just, if I miss parts, you let me know. Okay. So first of all, yes, within the application. So the, at each, if there are, are, there can be up to two co-applicants on an application. When you begin the application, it will be asking you for your resume and your personal statement, but it will also, there'll be a button to say, are you applying with a co-applicant? If you do check that, it will then go to that person to have them fill out that personal information as well. And SurveyMonkey Apply, which is the platform that we're using, will join those two together onto your application. So that's that for the personal information. Um, only the primary applicant will be submitting like the technical vision and some of, of the other materials. But of course, if you're a co-founding team, we encourage you to work together on those. Uh, but there's only, you will only be submitting them once. But each person will be submitting their own, you know, personal information, resume, personal statement, that kind of thing. Um, if you have two applicants, one of whom is more technical than the other, um, so the eligibility requirements are that fellows must have a bachelor's degree plus four years of technical R&D experience. If we have a co-founding pair where one person is eligible from that technical standpoint and the other person is maybe a little more borderline, then we would encourage the strongly eligible person to be the primary applicant. But we would be happy to see your co-founder as a co-applicant so we can really understand your co-founding team. Um, and then in terms of, oh, the stipend, yes. Okay, so occasionally in our ideal world, we would be able to provide a stipend and have two funded fellows if there are two co-applicants on an application. However, often we do not have sufficient funds from our sponsors to allow us to do that. In that case, we offer an affiliate fellowship to the second person. So the one person will be the funded fellow and one person will be the affiliate fellow. The only difference between a funded fellow and an affiliate fellow is the, the stipend. Um, and so we otherwise, all of the educational programming and mentorship and participation in the program is otherwise available to both affiliate and funded fellows. And so there really is an advantage, I think, to applying with your co-applicant co if you have a co-founder, even if ultimately we're only able to fund one person. Um, and then, you know, we give you the stipend and you are free to do with it as you like. So once we give you the money, it's yours. Um, if you want to divide it up, uh, that's your business. If you want to live on a pittance and put the money back into technical development, that's also your business. We don't ask questions once we provide you um, that money. We do just ask that both, if people are going to be fellows, they need to be working at their companies full time. Um, but as far as where the money goes, did I get all of your questions? 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. And then um, just for the eligibility side, my co-founder, he has been in RD, but it's been in like a lot of software development, stuff like that. He has a technical degree. He's sort of been on product building teams. Is that eligible enough for him to be a, uh, a the secondary applicant on that? Yeah, I think so. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Veronica. Uh, hello. Um, I did a postdoc at the Innovative Genomics Institute, um, and there's an entrepreneur program uh, um, and so, uh, my question is this, so I, I developed some technology that I'm spinning out now full time and started the company and the university will own the IP and, uh, as a standard. Um, but the IP is also not yet filed. And so I'm, I was trying to race against the clock and get it done, but I don't think that that timeline is going to match up with the application. So I, was wondering if you could talk about this. Um, is it an issue that the IP is owned by the university? And is it an issue that the content will be kind of less uh, nitty gritty technical details? Or is it okay if it's kind of zoomed out a little bit? I'll maybe let Jill take that one. <laughs> so yes, it's, it's totally typical for a fellow to come in and the university owns their their IP or the institution that they came from. And one of the first activities that they do is to license, have their company license that technology. Um, yeah, and we can provide support for that, that licensing process. Um, so yeah, that's totally fine. And you know, you're I think what you're talking about is like filing a provisional patent versus like a full patent. And also that's yeah, totally it's quite typical for people to have filed the provisional. And then, you know, as you like you know, I'd encourage you to file that as soon as possible. You get the priority date and then, you know, at, you're going to do experiments and then, you know, be able to fill that out fuller um, when you when you convert that to a, a full patent. So, yes, absolutely typical, not a problem at all. And absolutely what you should be doing. Uh, cool. Thank you. That That's helpful. And as far as the level of technical detail in the application, I would say just to make sure, like, could an ex could a technical expert have is there enough details that they could evaluate your application if it gets way too zoomed out in high level and someone can't really understand what you're doing or how it could be differentiated from from other technology that's prop that's going to be problematic because we can't tell um and so that's the, the lens i would view it from is like could someone read the application and have enough technical detail to really understand the innovation of what you're doing see that makes sense thank you um let's go to nicholas hey there thanks everyone so much for the information i'm going to keep my video off i'm sorry about that my internet connection is a bit unstable um i hope you can hear me well my first question is uh similar to william's question on the co-founder front my co-founder and i are about equally technical um in terms of years and and phd programs and whatnot do you have any guidance there on any advantages or disadvantages to choosing one co-founder as the primary or not? I, I don't. <laughs> not really. Okay. There really isn't much advantage. Um, we, we some basically administratively, someone has to be the primary applicant. Um, yeah. So that like we're only getting one submission of certain materials. Um, the other thing that I would say is that in a situation where we can only afford to fund one fellow, we have a funded fellow and an affiliate fellow, our default would be to fund the primary applicant. However, we generally, it's our policy to check in with that team and ask what they would like before we make any final decisions. So nothing is written in stone. Um, okay, the only other. Good. Yeah, the only other thing I'll note is that there is no pellet, there is no penalty if, if one applicant, either the primary applicant or the co-applicant, um, decides for whatever reason they need to withdraw during the application process. We understand it's it's startup world, things shift with co-founding teams. Sometimes suddenly um, people get other job offers and decide to take them. It's it's totally fine. Um it, either of the applicants can withdraw at any time with no penalty to the other applicant and we'll consider continue to consider that application with the solo applicant going forward excellent oh, and then my second oh, oh sorry. I, we should just probably say that you can't add a co-founder during the process so yes um, yeah and so all fe all fellows either funded or affiliate fellows have to come through the formal application process so there's kind of an advantage of 
putting someone as a co-applicant so they could potentially be a fellow even if that change plan changes. Sounds good. And then my second question is regarding lab space. Um, what if we already have lab space in another part of the Bay Area by the time the program begins? Will we still be able to access uh, the space at, at Berkeley Lab as well? And along with that, um, let's say we get lab space over on the peninsula. How close to Berkeley do we need to be uh, during the two-year tenure of the program? Yeah, so, I mean, you can have outside lab space. You can choose to set up, um, you know, you can choose to move to the space at Berkeley Lab. You could have some people there. You know, it is totally up to you, whatever works best for your company. Um, how close do you need to be? We expect you to come to, in person to um, Berkeley uh, every other Thursday. So as long as you are committed to doing that, um, yeah, you, you can be um, farther away. Excellent. I, Thank you so much. I would add to that too, though, that I think our experience has been that the fellows that more fully embed and show up in person to the um, both Berkeley Lab and Activate content um, get a lot more out of the program. Indeed. Yeah. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you. All right, my apologies. I was furiously typing an answer in the chat, um, but we'll move along to Omer next. I hope I get your name correct. Yes. Um, so, um, essentially, what I'm working on is essentially kind of productization of a nano sensor. So, um, that's kind of like part of the reason why I'm interested in activating that allowing me the opportunity to kind of like pivot more towards like deeper text. So the question I have is, um, is that something that is actually permissible, like within like the activate kind of like mission to kind of, you know, support uh, productization efforts as opposed to kind of like R&D, like the generic kind of like just validating the sensor itself. And second to that is, um, I'm already kind of reaching out to the Berkeley sensors and actuator sensor uh, center um, here at Berkeley. Um, and so would kind of like partnerships with that specific lab within Berkeley, is that something would be kind of made available through Activate or is that something I would have to negotiate um, outside of uh, cyclotron labs? Yeah, both good questions. Um, so I think for the first part, you're asking uh, about what if like you're really working on developing that into a product versus like a fundamental technology? Is that correct? That's correct. That's yeah, exactly I mean, I right. think, yeah, you, you, you would have to make the argument about like why this fellowship is gonna be really critical for your, you know, why it's gonna move the needle for you and your, in, for yourself and then for your company. Um, uh it's yeah it's a little hard to say you know given we don't have details um and then in terms of like making connections with with lab scientists and and folks at um on campus and stuff like that i mean like we try to make introductions where we can but it's you know it's up to you to to follow up on those and uh and really build the relationships great thank you uh, great. Let's go to Ivan next. Hi. Um, thanks, everyone, for sharing their stories. Um, I think I, I want to echo some questions that on um, some earlier question askers had, where I'm quite early stage, where I have an idea I'm really excited about, but I'm still in my finally my PhD, and I'm probably graduating in May 2024. Um, I was curious whether I should be looking to apply in this cycle or wait a year for the next one. Um, and from previous experience with like applicants who applied while they were still finishing their PhD, whether they kind of wish that they had spaced it out a bit more and given themselves a bit more time to do things like go through I Corps first and just kind of have more time to flesh out their application. Well, you can do I Corps while you're a PhD student, depending on if you know your relationship with your advisor and you know time time permitting all those things. Um, I guess I would say a couple of things. One. If you truly are going to graduate in May and your committee and your advisor would agree with you if asked that, um, or if you can leverage acceptance to the fellowship to get them to agree to that and you're confident in that, then you should definitely apply this year. Sounds like a great fit. I also would not delay your graduation, I suppose, in order to do I-Corps. 
like if you wanted to apply and be able to actually like graduate and start the fellowship, um, we have fellows do i -Corps during the program as well. Um, but in general, I would say that you should apply this year. But if, you know, I think just to be really honest about when your expected graduation date would be, because we do sometimes get into situations where people go, oh, I'm going to graduate in May. And we do a reference call with their advisor and their advisor says maybe next May. Um, and that's uh, that's where we get into trouble. I don't know if Jill has anything else to add. Well, I usually ask, like, would your committee agree that you're going to graduate in, in May? Yes. And as long as that's true, then yeah, go for it. Thank you. Right. Uh, is it Alexi? Want to go next? No? Alexi, are you there? Well, maybe we'll go to uh, go when. I'm sorry if I, that is not how you say your name. You can correct me uh, and we'll come back to Alexi in a moment. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's me. Uh ask a question and it's a quick question uh how many support letter uh you are suggest we should submit support letter how many ways we do not ask for any letters of support or reference letters um they're not a part of the fellowship application so zero. Oh, okay okay All right, Alexei, it looks like you're there now. You want to ask your question? You need to unmute first. Oh, sorry. sorry. There we go. Okay. Yeah, it was really complicated to, I'm from the phone. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for letting me ask my question. I actually asked it to, to, to Bren already and uh, to Rick. Uh, the issue is that I was participating in uh, in the previous round of uh, 2022, yeah, or 2023. I don't know how to, how we call it. And um, the idea was uh, a kind of a hut because it's CO two capturing and sequestration, but at the same time, it's a very complicated system. And Brenna suggests that it might be too early for um for this program so for for this year i would like to apply with another um another solution much simpler uh which we do have a demonstration already in the lab uh but we uh, want to push it to the market uh and um, we need a uh, help of the activate program to to help commercialize this uh, this technology and also i would like to apply with my co-founder uh, who is uh, helping me to, to to do this project uh, together with me so uh, my question is that is it possible to 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 change the the project if previous year i, I was applying with another one totally yeah yeah, and in the same time, is it possible to to keep my um, application, uh, which I submit last year, and didn't receive any any feedback on that? Obviously, uh, so I'm I'm not sure if it's right or wrong, or has to be redone, or has to be kept as is. So that th that's my question. Shall 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 I rewrite everything, or I shall keep my uh, you know, other other documents other than the, te the technical part, uh, same as the last year. Well, the questions have shifted at least a little bit. So I would make sure you reread the prompts and make sure you're really a answering the questions as asked this year. Certainly, um, you should submit your technical vision based on whatever technology you're you know, pursuing at this time and whatever is your best idea is what we want to hear about. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, of course, like for answers to personal questions, you know, reread them, have a friend read them, see if they're good and, you know, submit the best you have. We will not be looking back at last year's application materials. So whatever you submit this year is what we're going to is what we're going to read. So okay. thank you so much. Yep. Yeah. And I'll just say it's it's we've definitely had people who have applied before. They've pivoted. They apply again. They get in. It's It's pretty common. Absolutely. 
I do want to go to one question from the chat because it was for Nieves and Sarah. And so I want to bring that in. Um, Irene asked how your hiring is going. Nieves, do you want to share first? You're muted though. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so good question. So we actually, we started in 2020, but because uh, we didn't close a seed round, we weren't able to, to hire. And this year uh, we started hiring. So we're going to hire uh, three more people. Um, and, and yeah, so again, like the resources from Activate are very useful. We get, you know, all the tips and tricks from other fellows and from the fellowship managers. I would say another great thing is there's there's a great Activate network. So uh, people will post someone they know who's looking for a position. Of course, it's always best to cast a wide net and you know post in the right place, but um, it's also nice to have a network of people who can um, bring inbounds and also magnify your message to the appropriate uh, people who might be interested in the position. So I think that Activate has helped us with our hiring, um, being a more advanced company, like just with a little bit more experience, I think also makes us more attractive to potential applicants. Um, having like being part of Activate and being vetted um, gives people more confidence in your company. Um, and it's also great to have other, have the network just to ask for tips and tricks. And um, if you have an HR question to have a person that you can ask it to. In general, I'd say hiring right now is A-OK. -okay. Excellent. Thank you both. Um, and um, I am hoping that, um, Rick can help me answer a question in the chat. There's a question that perhaps um, something on the application may have changed that I'm not aware of. And there's something on the application that asks for one to two letters of recommendation here. Um, Rick is a member of our national team and I'm hoping he knows the answer better than perhaps better than I do. I'm looking at right now. I thought we um, did not, but it looks like we did. It looks like, I think that's just under an optional um, choice there. So it's not a, it's a supporting document. I don't think that it means that you have to as an optional for you, um, but we will be asking for references later in the um, application as well. Like later, if you make it past a certain round, uh, we will be asking for some references who we'll, we will do some phone calls with to talk about your technical abilities as well. So that might just be, you don't need to do it. There's no, there's no, um, there's no reason to have to upload those documents. Perfect. Thank you so much. And yes, we do ask for references from all of our finalists and we do call those references and speak to them. Um, so certainly at that stage, you do want to make sure you have those people lined up um, if you were to get to that point of the finalist stage, which would be in the spring or finalist event, as I mentioned, is the last week of February. Um, and so we would be speaking to those references around the, that time and probably asking for them around early February. So you want to make sure you have those lined up. Okay, um, I know we are getting close to time. I do not have a hard stop at three, so I'm happy to stay on the line and answer questions, but um, just wanna say that since I know we're at three till and let's go to Stacy. Great, thank you. Um, it's nice to meet all of you and thanks for all this information on the webinar. Um, basically just eligibility question quickly. Um, I'm from the US, I've been living in Canada and working. I, recently finished a postdoc and we've been incorporated, my co-founder and I here, and it's a Canadian company. Um, so I didn't know if Canadian companies were eligible um, in terms of the application for Activate, uh, as well as like, I just started a new teaching job that's gonna be finishing at the end of May. So um, I did notice maybe on the website, there was some uh, flexibility June to September for start date, or is it a hard start date in June? For this, the start date, I will take um, the start date. Uh, we want all fellows to start the fellowship in June. We have a retreat that's in person that everyone goes to, and we have programming that begins, and we can't recreate that later. So we do okay. want everyone to start that programming um, right away on June 1st. 
if we do have some flexibility in terms of when the official start date is, so if, for example, you were finishing up work on a grant or needed to actually have your defense date and graduate um, or other, other things of that nature, then official start dates can be a little bit later to accommodate, but we do expect all fellows to start programmatically on the first. Um, and then maybe I'll go to Rick or Jill if they want to field the kidney. I think you have to be an American company, but there might be some wiggle room. I don't know if Rick can field that better than me. Uh, no, I think that's right. In general, we want them to be U.S.-based companies. I think in our Anywhere cohort, we do have one, one exception. I would say for our Berkeley community, we are really looking for people who want to um, live in or relocate to the Bay Area and be in person for programming and um, be participating in person in our community um, every other week. So if you do not want to be based in the Bay Area um, or near one of our other hubs, then the Anywhere Activate community is probably a better fit for you. Um, okay. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. And if you want to send your question to apply at activate.org, just to make sure that I'm giving you accurate information, um, a staff member there will be able to field it for you. Okay. Will do. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Leo. Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for your intro. Um, I just have a simple question about the, um, so does it have to be a for-profit startup? Could it be some non-profit startup? It can be a nonprofit startup. Again, we really want people who are going to be making, how, we're, we're sort of measuring impact, not money. So we are agnostic about how you fund your company. If you want to bootstrap with grants, if you want to be a nonprofit, if you want to try to generate early revenue, that's all fine with us. Um, we are not like mandating that everyone be a VC backed startup. So yeah, if um, but we're really looking for impact. So if you think your best route to impact is through a nonprofit status, then uh, tell us about why and we'll be happy to consider it. Cool. Yeah, uh, yeah just to follow up on that. Um, so yeah, I'm still um, during doing my PhD um, closing to the um, end. And um, I was wondering as a very early stage um, startup founder, what would be the most um, important thing um, in terms of the, I mean, during the review process? Uh, would it be the technology or the impact, like you mentioned, or, you know, the people's capability? Since like, if we just have to select one, one thing. Ah, well, they can't just select one. Um, we are really looking for, imp like, awesome people, like people that we fundamentally believe in, who have developed compelling technologies that have the potential to make an impact. So we're really looking, um, at the end of the day, we support people, not companies. So if a fellow were to join the fellowship and realize through the course of the two years that maybe their idea isn't all they thought it would be, they can pivot to something else, we support that. They wanna wind down their company, that's not a failure for us, that's like a great learning experience. Um, if they learn that entrepreneurship is not the adventure that they wanna be on, that's also okay with us. So really at the end of the day, we're looking for great people. Um, with a compelling idea that we want to support. I don't know if Jill has anything else she wants to add. Great. I hope that was a great answer. I mean, it's it's hard to select one of those things. Yeah. I mean, we, we look at the whole package. <laughs> I think great, great. It, practically speaking in our selection process, we tend to focus on technology in the early rounds. We're filtering for tech that we think is differentiated, impactful. And as we move through the process, we start to focus more on the person, particularly because it's hard for us to focus on the person when we haven't met you yet. So starting in the video interview stage is when we really start to focus in on more on the person. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Yeah. And Catherine. Oh, Melanie's raising her hand. Oh, Melanie. So oh, there's just an interesting question in the chat that I think would require probably a lot more information to be to answer, um, which is, would a co-founder who is a fellow at another LEAP program be an impediment to this person's Activate Berkeley application? Um, that's a pretty complex question. Um, I can say that we have had teams where different people on the same, you know, working group have gotten two parallel participation fellowships in different organizations, but because Activate Berkeley is working hand in hand with the Cyclotron Road Leap program. Um, it probably would not be possible to have one co-founder at one Leap node and another co-founder here because it would be supporting the same project, essentially the same scope of work. Uh, but it sounds like, you know, if there's, if you have more questions and you want to kind of look at your case individually, I would follow up with us so we can ask you privately what the situation is. Um, and I, I would say in that case, you you would really need to make the case of why the the support 
is the goal of, the, of those different leaf nodes are similar and the support is similar, um, if not, not the same, but similar. And so you really need to make the case why we really want to be supporting people who really need our help and need that support. And so you really need to make the case to us of why the support from the other leaf node didn't get you where you needed to go. And maybe I'll just jump in just so folks, in case folks don't kind of grok this, that, you know, the Oak Ridge program, uh, John, I, I Googled your name. So maybe you have someone, a colleague at Oak Ridge, you know, they're funded by the same program offices at DOE that fund innovators here at Berkeley Lab and at Activate Berkeley. And so if a program manager saw the same company, the same co-founders here and at Oak Ridge applying for the same program that that might raise a red flag as well just to, a heads up yeah I would say it's it's I think it's a little bit different if someone's already in one of those programs we're supplying it's very common for people to apply for multiple lead programs in the same cycle yeah totally that's very common yeah um and Catherine hi thanks guys um so hopefully this question's relevant for other folks as well so I'm like a a business person with an engineering background on our team. And then my co-founder is a PhD scientist. She, we're both eligible, but she'll probably be the main applicant. Um, and then the other, the my question is from applying to things together, I've noticed there's a very big difference from kind of a business perspective of how you frame a problem. You say, here's what we've done. Here's what we're going to do. We know all the answers. You know, we just need to figure out these things. Whereas from a scientific perspective, it's, hey, we have these really cool questions we want to answer. Um, how, like, can can you support us to go answer them? And what's amazing about Activate is you fall right between those two worlds. But as we craft our application, do you have any advice of how to kind of lean into those two sides and make sure it meets the audience and the reader where they're at? That's a good question, Sheffield. It's fun. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you 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 want to, so it's not an academic grant, you know, like it's, we're looking towards a, a path to somewhere, um, a bridge to somewhere, and that's usually commercialization of a product that you sell for money. I mean, but maybe it's something else that has like an impact in some other way, just fitting with the question about the nonprofit. But yeah, we're, we're looking for like, what is that path? Um, and so how you answer that, um, you know, kind of comes down to like helping us see that um, and like what your vision is for getting there. Um, we definitely don't expect you to have all the answers. That's like what the fellowship is for us to answer those. And so like, if you don't know the answers, that's totally fine. Um, yeah, so take your best, best shot at it. Great, that's helpful. Thank you. The only thing I would say is like, I, one pitfall that I do see people sometimes fall into, particularly if they have a platform technology, and by that I mean a technology that could apply in a variety of markets, one pitfall I do see people going into is in the, you know, saying, I have a solution for this market problem. And if we don't really agree it's a great solution for that, you're relying on us to know that there are all these other applications, which we may or may not pick up on. Um, and so I always give the people the advice to make sure you're really clear about what the technical innovation is. And then if it could apply, sometimes it's, it can only apply to one thing. If you're trying to use advanced drilling techniques from oil and gas to improve geothermal, and that's what you're going to do, then like, okay, tell us that one thing. But if it could apply in a variety of markets to really make sure we know what is the core technical innovation, what are the broad range of markets it could apply to, and maybe what's your first guess at what you think the market is. But don't rely on us to see that it could apply across a range of markets because we might miss it. We might catch that. We might miss it. So <laughs> that's just one pitfall that I often see. So. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I don't see any other hands raised, and I think we got all the questions in the chat. I want to particularly thank Sarah and Nieves for joining us today and giving us their time to share their experiences as current fellows. Um, and then, of course, thank you to all the other staff who joined, and thank you to you for joining and sharing your questions with us. Um, I just want to remind you that you are welcome and invited at our happy hour at Cornerstone next Thursday, uh, October 5th, um, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. in Berkeley, um, and that if you do have other questions, you should absolutely um, send that, go to activate.org 
slash apply or cyclotron road, the cyclotron road website, you can get more information there, or you can also email apply at activate.org and an actual human will read your question and respond to it. Um, so I encourage you to do that if you have more questions that come up. Thanks, everybody.